So, uh, uh, as well as industrialist, I'm Michal. I, worked, uh, I work in uh, Kimvolk company. Uh, I am a contributor of Kubernetes currently, uh, but before I was contributing to OpenStack and mostly to OpenStack Cola project, which uh, uh, packs the OpenStack components into Docker containers and uh, uh, runs OpenStack as, uh, in a container environment. Uh, and uh, I'm working for Kimvolk, which is a company based in Berlin. Uh, we are doing uh, general Linux-related uh, uh, development, but uh, the most of work done by Kimvolk is visible in Rocket Project, but also in Systemd or with Scope. Uh, and you can check our activity on our blog. Uh, you can check our GitHub. As, uh, Everything we are doing is uh, open source. Uh, or you can just write uh, us an email if you have some questions regarding the company. So uh, I will start with explaining some basic concepts uh, around my presentation. First of all, container and virtual machine. I think that uh, most of you know the difference. So. I will not focus on that that much, but uh, you know, container doesn't use any new kernel insights and virtual machine uses the separate uh, operating system and uh, is uh, simulating the hardware. Container is just isolating uh, several things in a Linux system. Uh, and by cloud, I mean uh, any kind of service which is provided uh, over network to the user, and the uh, user doesn't have to know where uh, the service uh, is actually uh, provided. Uh, in case of container-based cloud, uh, container-based cloud is a cloud environment where uh, the user demands some containers and doesn't have to know where, uh, where they are phys physically located. This, uh, they are scheduled automatically. And uh, yeah, there, uh, today there were a, uh, a lot of talks about Kubernetes. Uh, that's the most popular uh, container-based uh, cloud uh, system, which is open source. But uh, there is also Mesos and Docker Swarm. And there are virtual machine-based clouds. Uh, OpenStack is uh, uh, the most popular of them from the open source project. From no open uh, clouds, uh, which are focused mostly on virtual machine, there is AWS and there is EC2 service. Uh, and uh, yes, what is the problem and uh, uh, what I try to address? And the problem is that these clouds, container and virtual machine based, are separate. So for running uh, uh, a cloud uh, consisting of virtual, virtual machines uh, booted from some QCO or raw images, you use OpenStack. For, uh, for running containers, you use Kubernetes. And uh, uh, yeah, it's very hard to maintain a single environment, single infrastructure, which provides both of them uh, to the user. And uh, th uh, that's the problem I would like to address. So how to create a homogeneous uh, cloud environment which addresses both uh, VMs and containers? Uh, and one of the answers which is implemented in several ways, and I will show them, is putting virtual machine inside container. It sounds crazy, but it works, and it, in my opinion, makes sense. And I will explain it in this presentation. But first of all, uh, let's begin with question, what needs to be done to run a virtual machine inside container? What uh, what does the uh, what characterizes the container which uh, can is able to run virtual machines? First of all, it has to be privileged, so we need to give the most of Linux capabilities uh, to that. Uh, it needs an access to C groups because, uh, for example, Libvirt is using C groups uh, for uh, resource management for virtual machines, it spawns, for QM processes, it spawns. 
we need also to provide an access to all the needed devices uh, we would like to share with VMs. And if we want to use uh, KVM, we need to also share the KVM devices. It's, yeah, it's just a, uh, a device in dev, uh, in dev directory. And here comes the question whether this idea of putting VMs inside containers, whether it improves security somehow, and uh, the obvious uh, answer is no. Uh, that's because it's privileged, uh, it has access to the devices, it has an access to C groups, and that's why if someone gets inside the container running virtual machine, we should assume that he has an access to the node, to the host. So it doesn't provide any security, uh, the idea of packing virtual machine inside container is only for simplifying things and creating a homogeneous environment. But the security of VMs is the same and we should care about uh, uh, yeah, uh, bugs in uh, any software which manages our virtual machines or runs it. So how to do that? and how to use the concept of uh, containerizing virtual machines in the cloud environments. There are two most popular ways. First of them is to put every QMO process in the separate container. And the second one is to just put a, a liver the daemon inside container and uh, have many QMO uh, processes inside that one container uh, with libvirt. In case of QMO in container, we have, uh, yeah, uh, in this case, we have some host, some node. We have two or more QMO containers and which uh, run the virtual machine. And uh, the two most known examples of uh, cloud uh, uh, systems which are using uh, uh, that approach, first of them is Borg. So Google Borg internally for virtualization is using uh, uh, containers and is putting each virtual machine inside another container and just schedule them as uh, the other containers. And also Rancher OS has a control plane for uh, virtual machines and it's using uh, exactly the same approach. And they have a Docker image for uh, with uh, QMO. Uh, you, can, you, you can even just pull it and uh, write docker run, rancher VM, something, something, <laughs> and you have a uh, running virtual machine. Uh, and uh, the advantage of that is that uh, uh, we don't rely on any other uh, tool for managing the, this life cycle, uh, the life cycle of VM. And uh, if we, for example, should doubt the VM, the uh, QMO process just goes down and for Docker or any uh, container runtime system, um, it's just uh, closed, uh, it's just a uh, uh, shutdown of container. And uh, in the same way, Kubernetes and the other container cluster systems uh, see that fact. Uh, but there are two disadvantages. The first of them is that uh, uh, you have to somehow manage the images. So if you have a Kubernetes environment uh, in which you would like to run the containers uh, with VMs, you need to somehow provide the um, QCO or raw images. Uh, and uh, yeah, if you are developing such a solution, you need to somehow provide the image service for that. And you have to put your own effort on providing the external storage and play with uh, QMU uh, options. Uh, in case of delivered in container, we assume that uh, every node uh, in the cloud is running one livered container. So in case of Kubernetes, it could be a daemon set. Uh, and uh, 
there are a lot of uh, QMO children of uh, Libert. Libert manages their life, uh, their life cycle. And uh, the most known examples of that are, um, the, the most known example is OpenStack Cola project, which I mentioned uh, uh, on the introduction of myself. So it's a project which containerizes the OpenStack. Uh, they also have an option to run OpenStack on top of Kubernetes. And there is also Virtlet, which is a project that aims to run, uh, uh, which aims to uh, make a VM uh, a native citizen of uh, Kubernetes. So it's implementing the VM pod uh, feature. And there is also a Kubert project, uh, uh, which uh, the guys uh, developing, uh, developing it uh, had a presentation yesterday in the uh, virtual machine and infrastructure as a service track. Uh, and yeah, the main advantages is that Libert provides uh, an abstraction for managing images. Uh, it manages the remote storage and it's much easier than dealing with uh, QML directly. But on the other hand, you need to somehow interact with that uh, uh, Libert, which is itself a layer of abstraction. So, it's not very easy to decide whether we go with QM or, or, or Libvirt. Uh, there are some projects which use the first approach. There are some projects which are using the approach of Libvirt. And we may see in the future which uh, approach was better and uh, which layer of abstraction provided more problems. So. How exactly it relates to the cloud? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Virtlet is a project which uh, uses VMs in Kubernetes. Uh, and how it do that? Uh, it uses the container runtime interface. There was a presentation today uh, explaining what it is, but I will uh, explain it uh, quick, uh, quickly. So CRI is a mechanism in Kubernetes which allows you to uh, write your own server which provides some run runtime service uh, to Kubernetes. By default, Kubernetes uses Docker. So if you run some pod uh, on Kubernetes, uh, you receive uh, a bunch of Docker containers running somewhere in the cluster. By CRI, you can replace that with any kind of runtime system you want. Uh, this is how it looks. So uh, in uh, nodes in Kubernetes, there is a kubelet, which is a daemon uh, managing a life cycle of the container and node. So it only receives the information uh, from kubescheduler what uh, it has to do. And uh, the most known example of the CRI uh, service is Rocketlet, uh, which uses Rocket, but for virtual machines, you can also use CRI. And just by getting a definition of pods, run the virtual machine and interact with Libvirt instead of Rocket. So. Uh, these things work, but uh, do we really need such an inception? It, it, it maybe sounds crazy because why, why do we need to run, uh, to run virtual machines uh, inside container? Uh, but I think uh, we need this inception because uh, uh, the goal of Kubernetes and uh, uh, container management system are, uh, is to be as small as possible and uh, do not implement uh, a more complicated logic. Instead of that, they want to give the people the opportunity to create this logic itself. A good example is uh, uh, a concept of operators. There were a bunch of uh, talks in this track uh, about, an operat uh, about operators. And they are, they are using Kubernetes, but uh, uh, they prevent uh, they prevent Kubernetes itself of being too big, 
so that's why uh, Kubernetes community doesn't implement a logic of upgrading stateful uh, uh, applications uh, uh, except, the, uh, except the concept of stateful sets. But um, that, that's why people are moving com more complicated deployment logic to outside things like operators. And I think that we should see any solution trying to uh, run a virtual machine inside container as a solution of such kind. So we are just using the simple logic of uh, Kubernetes to uh, achieve something more complicated. And we just add uh, one layer of abstraction to achieve something which uh, gives profits because uh, I think that uh, uh, separation between VM clouds and uh, container clouds. Uh, it's a huge problem which, uh, some, uh, which even somehow may prevent some people from thinking about uh, using Kubernetes if they are using a lot of VMs and have an infrastructure uh, acting with uh, just uh, uh, virtual machines. So, Unfortunately, uh, I cannot show a demo because uh, I have no adapter for my laptop. Uh, uh, USB-C. So yeah, we tried it before the talk. Unfortunately, I cannot show it in a demo on my laptop. We have uh, some time so I can, there is one demo on GitHub of Virtlet, how it works. So, okay. Do you see everything? Okay, it's, maybe that would be better. So, uh, in this demo, uh, first of all, we run uh, the virtlet server and then start the local Kubernetes cluster. And after that, we have a definition of pod. I will try to stop it here, yeah. So this is just an usual pod uh, where we define a container name, Fedora. It uses the Fedora image, uh, which is served by some HTTP server. It's just a, a key call. Uh, oh, mm, maybe that will work. So display port. Uh, no, it's the USB-C. HDMI, I'm, I'm not, I'm dubious. This didn't work before. Uh, oh, it's just DisplayPort. Oh, it's DisplayPort. Yeah. Oh, that, and that's full-size DisplayPort, which we don't have. Never mind. Uh, okay, so, yeah, I'm not, yet another try off. <laughs> Saving my demo. Okay, well, let's go. Okay, so that's the definition of pod. And uh, we can just create uh, this pod uh, by kubectl create. And uh, it will work. Let me continue the demo. And yeah, it takes some time to run the virtual machine. That's for, uh, why for some time the container is in creating state. But after 14 seconds, it became running. Uh, now we can get into the container. So that's why there is Docker Compose exec libvirt virtual list. So the libvirt is the name of container which runs libvirt. And yeah, we can also access a console Okay, now of containerized libvirt.
Oh, okay, here is just slow typing. Okay, and I can also show you, I have a project just called Docker Libvirt, which is very tiny Docker environment for putting Libvirt in the container, just to not make docker run um, comment very long. I put it this definition inside uh, docker compose cm file. So uh, I expose part of libvirt here. Uh, there are the uh, necessary mounts I mentioned uh, uh, in my presentation. And there are also volumes for libvirt where the actual instances and uh, uh, disks for uh, libvirt are stored. So we can just use named volumes for that. And I have also here a start script which wraps uh, libvirt. Uh, here I do some magic with detecting uh, whether uh, which type of processor we have and which uh, uh, KVM module uh, I have to load. And also some necessary CH modes, uh, CH routes for configuration files. Uh, that's because if you mount uh, some file to the container in Docker, there is no way to uh, define to which user it should belong uh, and uh, uh, what's the uh, what are the permissions for the file. So if, uh, if we are mounting uh, these configuration files here, we need to ch mount them uh, inside uh, start script. And uh, the configuration of libvirt and QEMU is very small. So for libvirt, we just <laughs> want to uh, make it listen on the socket so we can uh, contact with libvirt uh, outside the container to not have to enter the container every time and just use, um, be able to use virt uh, on the host or even virt graphical virt manager on the host. And we have also QMO config, which defines the user earth group. And uh, that's that example. Uh, I mentioned also about uh, kubevert project. So the, defini uh, so the difference uh, between virtlet and kubevert is that virtlet, as, uh, as you saw on the demo, uh, uses a pod definition for running vi virtual machines. Uh, Kubevert uses third-party resources for that. Uh, I will not, uh, uh, I'm not going to uh, explain it in details because uh, uh, Kubevert uh, uh, was explained yesterday on the talk. Uh, and Let's go back to the presentation. That's unfortunately all I wanted you to show. I'm sorry again for not showing you live demo from my laptop. Do you have any questions? Yes? Why would you want to run a virtual machine in a, in a containerized environment? What's the use case? So the use case is... Uh, uh, okay, so the question was, uh, why do I even want to uh, run virtual machines in the containerized environments? Uh, and what's the use case for that? Uh, use case for that is, uh, I think, uh, the migration between uh, virtual machines and containers. So some company which was using virtual machines for a long time thinks about Kubernetes, doesn't really want to... Uh, manage uh, uh, two separate clouds for a long future and they w want to be able to use Kubernetes but on the, uh, at the same time provide some option for uh, virtual machine, uh, traditional virtual machine users 
uh, without necessity of maintaining the uh, virtual machine oriented cloud. Uh, I realize that it's not a problem in case of AWS uh, or clouds which are not managed by ourselves, but I think that, uh, uh, you know, uh, using Kubernetes as a main infrastructure without uh, managing separate OpenStack, for example, without having it on top of Kubernetes or using something else like virtual for virtual machine, I think it's really simplifies things, and that is my assumption. Maybe I am wrong, but that's the idea I have behind it. Yeah, this is, this is fair, fairly near and dear to our hearts at CoreOS, and a lot of this work fits into our work, and Rocket is our project, and I spoke earlier today about operators, I think this kind of dovetails into that as well. And you touched on this a little, but I want to make sure we draw it out. One of the reasons why you would want to package virtual machines into containers has little to do with what you think of as the execution isolation features. Um, and, and, uh, and, and has a lot more to do with uh, the, the convenience of packaging and distribution, the ability to do verification on that package that's a discrete, a discrete containerized package, and most importantly, to schedule it dynamically around grid compute resources with an orchestration system like Kubernetes. So the units of scheduling, the thing we know how to move around between computers in these systems is a container, not a virtual machine, right? So that is a, a whole other set of reasons why we would want to package virtual machines inside containers is to give a, a handle to orchestration systems on legacy applications that, that exist at this time already in virtual machines. You get the container around them as a package and now you can schedule them dynamically on, on your cluster resources the way you can containerized applications, which certainly he touched on, but I want to make sure to kind of bring out and put a nail on top of it. There you go, sorry. No problem. So, what's the next question? Oh, yeah, it looks like that. Uh, does the orchestration layer uh, of, of, your, of your concept of your implementation support fancy virtual machine stuff like live migration? Uh, for now, uh, it doesn't, but both uh, Virtlet and uh, Kubevert uh, want to address it somehow. The, uh, Oh, uh, I'm sorry, again, uh, I, for I keep forgetting about it. The question was uh, uh, whether uh, we want to address more complicated uh, uh, operations for virtual machines like live migration, for example. Uh, and uh, that isn't implemented yet, I think, in any of projects, but uh, the most probably uh, we will need a, an external controller similar to operator which will consume the third party resource uh, called life migration or something like, like that and uh, uh, call uh, libert API underneath. Um, what about the life vertical scaling? Uh, what about scaling? Life vertical scaling, another fancy virtual machine feature. So, uh, uh, the question was, uh, what about the other uh, operations like scaling of virtual machines? Uh, and uh, to be honest, I didn't think about it yet. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, but uh, life, uh, probably life migration would be the first you know, more complicated feature of virtual machines, which will be touch bar project and it's, I think, designed now and maybe implemented in the near future. Okay. So my question is related to the first question, the first answer, the second. So the whole use case is like, you have the operator which has deployed Kubernetes cluster. Let's take Kubernetes. Some minions, hundreds of minions. And then they said, okay, now we need VM payload. And then this comes a solution, but that operator still to deploy OpenStack or throws OpenStack out of the window. Because unless you throw out stack OpenStack out of the window, instead of simplifying things, you add Kubernetes, and afterwards you still need to have libert XML managed by Noel, managed by heat. 
So you inserted underneath a restrictive thingy, and the whole definition thing, unless you throw out Nova and Heat, doesn't go away. So the question was, uh, oh, the question, uh, the, uh, the thesis was uh, that uh, putting open, or open stack inside Kubernetes doesn't simplify things because you still have Nova, you still have uh, heat and uh, the lot of components and the, it doesn't really simplify things for the operators. Uh, I only provided Cola as an example. Virtlet project isn't using OpenStack at all. So uh, it, I, I just uh, wanted to make this presentation like objective, not promote a single solution. But yeah, um, uh, if you want to throw, throw out OpenStack, you are very free to do that. Okay, so part of why we invested a lot of time and effort and, and, uh, and friends of ours in the community and, and contractors and other folks we've worked with invested a lot of time and effort specifically in uh, porting OpenStack, the OpenStack control plane into containers and running it as a Kubernetes application is actually that our findings are quite contrary to what your suspicions are. By unifying around a single management interface, that is the Kubernetes Kubernetes API, by deploying OpenStack, which is just a bunch of applications, as wonderful as it seems and as magical as it seems because it's a VM management system, all it really is is a big stack of Python apps. So we put them in containers, we run them on Kubernetes, we schedule them with Kubernetes, we recover from failure, which are quite frequent in those Python apps, with <laughs> Kubernetes. Um, and actually, we've found, and, and I think there's, there's a fair amount of stuff on the core OS.com blog about the the project between CoreOS, Kinvolk, Intel, the Rocket Open Source Project, and all of the pieces that fit into to the OpenStack port for Kubernetes. Um, uh, the finding actually is that we reduce the administrative overhead by unifying around a single cluster management interface instead of trying to deploy OpenStack applications in an OpenStack silo outside of Kubernetes. So that's like the aims there. To, to answer the speculation that that adds to complexity and would only make things more difficult, all I could do is encourage you to grab the stuff and try it out and see if, 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 if you find that that's true. about containerizing controls, uh, control uh, part of OpenStack. I have concern about containerizing QMU with application payload of the tenants. Okay, so tenant application payloads. Yes, so the folks you're serving, they still consume OpenStack APIs and schedule their virtual machines right. through the OpenStack facilities. Processes are running inside these containers. Yes. So that is a concern. Well, actually, let me back up for a minute there. Um, it is not necessarily true that customer VMs are running inside containers when, when we're kind of talking about two separate things here and we blended the issue together a little bit. The talk is about running VMs inside containers. The OpenStack work, which relates to it and encompasses it to run parts of the control plane in terms of containers, does not necessarily imply that your end user, your customer VMs, are packaged in containers. They are VMs consumed from OpenStack, scheduled with OpenStack. And running on their network. If running on high, on top of the on top of the hypervisor at yes, least yeah. I mean, being yeah. virtual machines yes so is that a better answer yes and then that gets more at the now I understand yeah, but No, no, it, it, I think it is, that, that doesn't relate. If you want to uh, use the concept of tenants for VMs, like in OpenStack, you can run OpenStack uh, uh, on, on, on the Kubernetes and uh, just provide the OpenStack control plane to the end user and thread the whole Kubernetes stack running this uh, as a thing only for your internal operators. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, that, that's why I wanted to put the things neutral. If, if, some, if someone needs OpenStack, I think they should be free to use OpenStack. If not, then not. D different people have different needs. Thank you. <laughs>